glad you are here. Let's start off and sing about our mighty God. With what a mighty God we serve. Y'all stand with me. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. Sing that again. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Lift up your banner, let the anthem ring. Praises to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Amen. Y'all go ahead and be seated. Am I on? Am I on? <laughs> yeah. You'd be good. <laughs> oh, we're glad y'all are here this morning. As most of you know, Brother Norman is on vacation this week, and, and he and his family have gone uh, to Panama City, Florida for the week, and they are hopefully relaxing. So, barring any major catastrophe, don't text, call, or email them. <laughs> Leave them alone. Now, let them, let them have a good week of relaxation, a good vacation, uh, and we pray that, that they will be able to come back, and Norman and I will come back refreshed uh, this next week. So, but y'all keep praying for them for safe travels uh, and just to have a good time. So... I think that he'll enjoy being down there, being able to sit and uh, watch his grandkids do their thing, which whatever that's going to be. Um, we want to also lift up Sue Bishop. Uh, just pray for her. She fell this week and, and has a mild concussion and some other uh, lacerations and stuff on her arms. And, and uh, so keep her in your prayers. Um, and oop, I forgot, I can't read my own note. I know I'm getting there. Uh, Brandy Corberly is Debbie Bullard's daughter, is dealing with uh, some long term effects of COVID. Uh, so we want, we want to keep her in a prayer. And my understanding is that the, the, these effects, she was told, will probably be there for the rest of her life. So we want to keep her in our prayers too. We also know, as many of you know, Brian Frost is still dealing with his cancer, and I think he has two, radio, radio, two chemo treatments left. Uh, so keep him and Julie in your, prayer, in your prayers as well. Uh, this morning we're going to welcome uh, Brother Gary Stevens. Uh, Gary has pastored uh, First Baptist Church in Morse for quite a few years, retired just a few years ago. And he is going to be here. He and his lovely wife are over here. Uh, and he is going to be here. Gary was here, remember here, a few years ago. 50 years ago. I don't remember that. <laughs> now, he was here and he taught Sunday school here. And he was here 50 years ago. And so he is kind of familiar with Central. Although I know it's changed in 50 years. We're glad to have you, Brother Gary, I'm glad to have your wife, and we're glad you all are here this morning uh, to bring a message to us, so I know that you'll enjoy what he brings and, and welcome him here in just a little bit. Uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer for these prayer requests, and uh, any others, I know many of you have, have things on your heart and on your mind um, that you can lift up to the Lord at this time, okay? Father, I want to thank you this morning for just the privilege it is 
come together and listen to your name. Um, Father, and just lift up your name in praise. Father, we want to ask that you be with Sue as she heals. Uh, Father, just heal her body. Uh, garden, protect her, help her to feel better. <clears throat> Father, we want to lift up Brandy to you. and uh, Father, we ask that you heal her of these things. We know that there's things that we need to deal with, Father, and, and we ask that you wrap your loving arms around her and, and, and give her comfort and peace, knowing that whatever she has to deal with is a result of COVID. Father, that you have the ability to heal, but Father, she has to deal with them, that you're going to be right there with her along with her. Uh, Father, help her, help this to draw her closer to you. Father, and there's others in our hearts and our minds that, that uh, Father, that are either struggling or hurting or are sick, and we want to lift them up to you. And Father, be with Brian and Julie as he continues to, to go through his chemo treatments and uh, just remind them how much we love them and how much you love them. Father, we're grateful for your loving arms. Father, thank you for this morning and just the time we can come and open up your word and hear what you have to say to us and time we can sing praises and lift up our voices to you, Father, Father to sing and, and do the thing that we were designed and created to do is worship you. Father, thank you for all that you've given. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. And if you're visiting with us, uh, if you'll look in your bulletin, you can take your bulletin in the third part. You can tear off, fill that out, fill that out and place it in the offering plate for us this morning. We'd love to have a record of your visit. For right now, we're going to invite y'all to stand with us as we love one another in the love of the Lord. So y'all stand and welcome each other here.
for loving one another is the way of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, all are we washed in the blood and grounded in the word, living in salvation. Y'all sing with me as you find your seats. Love somebody in the name of the Lord. Greet your neighbor with a smile. Let the love of Christ come shining through as you're walking down the aisle. For loving one another is the way of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, all are we. Washed in the blood and grounded in the word, living in salvation full and free. Amen. Y'all go ahead and be seated. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit from life from above, into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made, when as a sinner I came. Took of the offer of grace, he did proffer, he saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away. And my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure. There in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day When at the cross I believed Which is eternal and blessing supernal From His precious hand I received Heaven came down and glory filled my soul When at the cross the Savior made me My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, 
it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing till the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and your soul to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I'll keep on singing. Ten thousand years and then my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Father God, thank you for the blessings you stood upon us. Thank you this week you and us, and we thank you for the rain that we received last night, Lord. We just thank you for that. Father, we just lift up our nation. We pray for our president, leader of our country, state, and our communities, Lord. I just pray they just seek you, and the decisions fix us daily. Father, we lift up Brother Norman to you. That would be good, good relax, relax station and rest on his vacation. But be with him, Brother Andy, as they lead us, Lord. Be with Brother Stevens, he brings a message. Father, we just thank you for the things that you've done for us, Lord, we take for granted so much, but Lord, just may we stop and say thank you for what you've done. Father, we ask to go with this offering. Father, we just pray that it be used to honor and glorify you in no other way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there was a young man by the name of Leroy, and he was in his first year as a pastoral student at, at, at the uh, seminary. 
He was reading a letter from his folks, and they had enclosed a $100 bill in the encouraging letter. Well, as he read the letter, he was looking out the window. And down on the street, there was an old man with a coat, shabby coat on, hat pulled down, sunglasses on, sitting on, standing under a street lamp. He thought, you know, he needs this $100 bill more than I do. So he put the envelope, put the $100 bill in an envelope and wrote, never give up on the envelope, and gave it to the roommate to take to the old man. Well, that evening, he was told there was a man downstairs that wanted to see him. And he went downstairs, and the man said, never gave up, won the horse race at the track, paid 10 to 1, you won $1,000. I told you that story to illustrate a point. That point being that uh, what you see is not always what you get. Uh, you may think that you see an old preacher with tons of biblical knowledge and lots of experience. You're only half right. You only see an old preacher. <laughs> I was manager in the telephone company in Pampa in the early 70s. How many of you here were in the early 70s at this church? Quite a few, quite a few. And I was a member of Central Baptist Church. In fact, my wife, Jean, made a profession of faith in this church. She went to the pastor, Ted Savage, y'all. Any of you remember Ted Savage? And told him she was going to be making that decision on Sunday. He said, how can that be? Gary's a deacon. Well, I'll tell you how it could be. In 1954, we Baptists had a program called A Million More in 54. Her cousin happened to be the pastor of their church in Louisiana and kept after her to get saved. Bottom line, there was only 999,999 that got saved that year. The Holy Spirit was more effective than her cousin when it came to convicting one of sin. So she made her profession of faith here. Well, I worked for the telephone company for about 40 years and retired in 2004. Our church at First Baptist Church in Canyon had services at Paladura Canyon during the summer uh, for visitors that happened to come and would like to attend a service. And then on several occasions, I preached at those particular services. And through a series of God-led events, I was called to be the pastor of First Baptist Church in Morris, Texas in 2009. It was a wonderful little church with wonderful people, and we enjoyed that for 11 years. We were there for 11 years, but when I couldn't rattle off the names of my eight great-grandchildren, 18 grandchildren I could rattle off pretty quick, but I struggled with the greats. I knew it was time for me to retire, so I retired last August. Well, your pastor called me several weeks ago and said God told him to call you and tell you that God wants you to preach at Central Baptist Church on June the 13th. Well, how does one say no thanks to an invite like that? But I would like to ask, has he ever used that line on any of you all? Raise your hands if that's... A it's pretty persuasive, isn't it? Pretty persuasive. Well, so here we are this morning, and let's see what we can accomplish this morning in the absence of your wonderful pastor. In the first chapter of the book of Genesis, in verse 26, the Bible says, Let us, us being the Trinity, make man in our image after our likeness. And in the last chapter of the last verse in the book of Revelation, the Bible says, The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Folks, this book, this book is all about Jesus Christ and God's grace. It's a road map for life and a recipe book for living a wonderful life. Let me say that again. It's a road map for life and a recipe for living a wonderful life. 
Well, do we always follow that road map or use that recipe? No, not as individuals or as a nation. Here's an example in our world today. In Genesis 12, 3, God is talking to Abraham. He said, I'll bless those who bless you. And in him who dishonors you, I will curse. In Isaiah 41, 11, Isaiah says concerning the nation of Israel, those who strive against you shall be nothing and shall perish. Folks, for many years, our nation has supported the nation of Israel, our strongest ally in the Middle East. And God has blessed our country in so many wonderful ways because of that. Today, we have those leaders in our government that would have us support Israel's enemies. Folks, if we don't change our ways as a nation, uh, this COVID pandemic might be a walk in the park compared to what we might be ahead of us. There are those who think that the Word of God and the United States Constitution are outdated instruments. They're dead wrong on both accounts. Well, okay, let's get back to the Word of God. We mentioned that it's all about Jesus Christ and the grace of God from front to back. Well, you might think, but Gary, what about books like Esther? That's a good story, a good, neat story, but there's no mention of God, faith, or religion in that book. Well, think about this. Many stories and issues in the Old Testament are symbolic of New Testament truths. Let me say that again. Many stories and issues in the Old Testament are symbolic of New Testament truths. Many commentators believe that to be so, and I do also. Well, what about the book of Esther? Most commentators on the book of Esther, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with that story, most commentators in the book of Esther believe that it's a book that reveals how God works behind the scene to accomplish His will. And that is an accurate approach, really, for the book of Esther. It doesn't ever mention the word God. It doesn't mention faith. But what does it? what is it all about? And I believe that's an accurate approach to the book of Esther. But... I think there's another side to the book of Esther that we can look at. There are several characters in the book that I think could be symbolic, keyword symbolic, of other beings or things. Those characters are King Ahasuerus, Queen Vashti, Esther, Mordecai, Haman, and there were two evil men. Or time does not permit for us to read the whole book of Esther, so we'll read certain scriptures. And if you will permit me to do so, I'll summarize other parts of the book. So if you've got your Bible, see, please join me as we read Esther 1 through 5. Esther 1 through 5. I'm reading out of the ESV today. Esther, verse chapter 1, 1 through 5. Now, now in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus, and Ahasuerus is not actually his name. It's kind of like a title if you look in a Bible dictionary. But he reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces. In those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were before him while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days. And when these days were completed, the king gave all for all the people present in Susa, the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. Our first character to look at in our story is King Ahasuerus. 
Now, here's a guy that really has it made, you'd think. He's, he's a king. He has wealth. He has power. It appears that uh, the, the, least, the feast lasted 180 days, that there was no problem of war or enemy attacks. And we'll see that he had a beautiful wife. So all is wonderful in the life of King Ahasuerus. So what could his life be symbolic of? Well, for the sake of discussion, let's say that his life is symbolic of your life and my life. To some degree, you and I are free will people within our kingdom, our own little kingdom. Our cir some circles are large, some circles are small, but we're the king, or that's the symbolic word that we're going to use for that. That's being all those things we have the authority over. If they're good decisions that we make, we're blessed. If they're bad decisions, there usually is a price to pay. For, for the sake of discussion, let's say that the king uh, is symbolic of any individual. And let's see if the book of Esther has anything that is symbolic of New Testament truths or principles. So be thinking about symbolism as we talk about this. Well, now let's look at our second character in the book of Esther, Vashti. Join me as we read chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mr. M, Mr. B, Mr. H, Mr. B, and Mr. A, and Mr. Z, and Mr. C, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was a lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, delivered by the eunuchs. At this, the king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. So in the king's kingdom, there was a, he was, there was, Vashti was the queen to the king, a beautiful lady, that, and the king was very proud of her. But she disappointed him with what? Disobedience. Disobedience. So he got rid of her if we read the rest of the story. He lost his prized possession. Did he feel empty? Well, the scripture indicates that he was mad, but you got to believe that he kind of was down in the dumps because he had lost his queen. Now think about that. Most of you all, probably like I did, were, married, were, were uh, saved. I was saved when I was 10 years of age. So most of us may have never underwent or understood what it meant to be without Jesus. But I've known people that had everything in the world. They had wealth, popularity, power, but they didn't have Jesus Christ in their, in their life. And you'll talk to them, and after they accepted Christ as their personal Savior, you talk to them, and they said, I, I, you know, I just can't, can't believe how empty my life was until Jesus came into my life. So think about that in terms of, of uh, the king losing his queen. So what is Queen Vashti symbolic of in our story? Well, based on how the story turns out, she's symbolic of our old sin nature, our old sin nature. And what is a character trait of our old sin nature? Disobedience. And that's exactly what she was to the king. So out with the old and in with the new. But what is the new? Well, that brings us to our third and fourth character to look at, Mordecai and Esther. So join me in Esther 2, Verses 1 through 7, if you would. Esther 2, verses 1 through 7. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom 
to gather all the beautiful young virgins in the harems in Susa, the citadel, under custody of Hegai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given away, and let the young women who pleases the king be queen instead of Ashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconan, 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 king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadadash, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at, and when her father or mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So let's see about Esther and Mordecai here. So the king in the king's kingdom, there was a Jew named Mordecai, and he had a cousin that he had reared whose name was Esther. Mordecai was able to get Esther into position to be the king's new queen, and she was eventually crowned the new queen. So what are Mordecai and Esther symbolic of in our story? Well, first let's take a look at Mordecai. He was a Jew in a foreign land. Many people in the community that he lived hated the Jews. He was able to accomplish an unbelievable task of getting Esther, a Jew, to be the king's queen. We'll see in the rest of the story that he was instrumental also in saving thousands of Jews' lives. So we're going to say that Mordecai is symbolic of the Holy Spirit working in the lives of God's people. Symbolic, symbolic of the Holy Spirit is Mordecai. Well, what about Esther? Esther was also a young Jewish lady. She was very obedient, very obedient to her cousin Mordecai. She was very beautiful, a wonderful young lady. So if Queen Vashti was symbolic of the old nature, Queen Esther would have to be symbolic of the new nature, that being faith in Jesus Christ. Now, we're not saying that she had faith in Jesus Christ. We're saying that what she had was symbolic of that faith. Well, now let's look at our fifth characters, two of the king's eunuchs. Let's read Esther 2, 19 through 23. Esther 2, 19 through 23. Now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting in the king's gate, Big Than and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on the king Ahasuerus. In other words, they wanted to kill him. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai. And he told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows. And it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Question for you, was the mention of these two thugs just coincidental or was it symbolic of two thieves that went to the cross with Jesus? Mordecai's action in reporting this scheme saved the king's lives. I'll let you decide if it's coincidental or did God put it in there as a uh, indication of what we might want to look at Esther from a symbolic standpoint. All right, let's look at the sixth character in our story. That would be Mr. Haman. To get a true picture of Mr. Haman and who he might be symbolic of, 
Please join me in the third chapter of Esther. Now, this is going to be a lengthy read, lengthy read but we need to read this third chapter in order to get an idea of what Mr. Haman's all about. Chapter 3, after these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the Agite, the son of Hamdatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai throughout the whole kingdom of Harassus. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur, that is, they cast lots before Haman day after day, and they cast it in month after month until the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of ever the people and they do not keep the king's laws. So it is not the king to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I'll pay 10,000 talent, talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they may put it into the king's treasures. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman the Ag- Agai, son of Hamdathia, the enemy of the Jews, and the king said to Haman, The money is given to you, the people also to do with them as it seems good to you. <clears throat> then the king's scribes were summoned on the thirteenth day of the first month, and an edict according to all that Haman commanded was written to the king's satraps, to the governors over all the provinces, and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script, and every people in its own language. It was written in the name, name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king provinces with instructions to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. So Mr. Haman was a man who loved power. He was a man that hated the Jews. He wanted to destroy God's chosen people, the Jews, and he had the king's blessing to do so. Now remember, the king had a new nature in Esther, but he was also unaware of what was going on. So in our story, Mr. Haman would be a symbolic of Satan himself. If you go to the Bible dictionary and you look up Mr. Haman, you know what that means? The word Haman means magnificent. You think Satan thinks he's magnificent? He does. He does. Well, how did Mordecai react to what was happening? Remember, he is symbolic of the Old Testament. I mean, of the Old Holy Spirit. Well, let's see. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Now, he's talking about the edict from the king to, to kill the Jews. When Mordecai learned all that he had been, been, had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud 
and bitter cry. Well, how does the Holy Spirit react when we as Christians conduct ourselves in a way that's not pleasing to the Lord? We either grieve the Holy Spirit or we quench the Holy Spirit. And from this passage, I think we can say that Mordecai was deeply grieved over the message that they were going to kill the Jews. Well, we've looked at the characters that could be symbolic of New Testament truths. In the interest of time, let me just summarize the rest of the story. Mordecai went to Queen Esther with the bad news that the king and Mordecai, that Haman and the king had rigged up and were going to kill all the Jews and convinced her that she had to go to the king to get the edict stopped. And through a series of God-led events, she was able to get the truth out. It was discovered just how evil Mr. Haman was, and Mordecai was promoted to the prime minister in his spot. Mr. Haman was hung on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Well, what about the Jews? In those days, a king's edict could not be reversed once that that ring stamped on a, uh, a parchment, it couldn't be reversed. And those, I don't think that's my false teeth. <laughs> In those days, the king's edict could not be reversed. So Queen Esther convinced the king to issue another edict that said that the Jews could defend themselves. They did, and thousands of Jews were saved. So what can we take from this message today? First, the Bible is the true word of God, and we as his children need to be good students of it every day. And by the way, if we want to grow, if we really want to grow, we can't just casually read our Bibles. We need to study the word of God. Now, the gospel is the milk. You don't have to be the sharpest knife in the box to understand the gospel. You go to that New Testament, and it is there. The gospel's there. But the meat, the growth hormone, sometimes we have to dig in and study the Bible and have the Holy Spirit to help us. We need to be aware that God is at work in our lives when we really don't realize that he is. We're his children and he is at work in our lives. And things that go on in our life that we probably don't think that he's in control, but he is. And I can tell you, I can't tell you for sure that God said, I'm going to put the book of Esther into my Bible, into my word, and it's going to be symbolic of New Testament truths, principles, and values. I don't know that God said he was going to do that. But I can tell you for sure that we can use the story of Esther to illustrate New Testament truths, principles, and values. We need to be so very thankful and appreciate the blessings that we have. We take so many of them for granted, don't we? We're kind of like the, the man that had the talking dog for sale, had a talking dog. Ran an ad in the paper, talking dog for sale. Well, this fellow read the paper and said, man, I've got to go see this, a talking dog. So he, the man lived out in the country, so he drove out in the country, went up to the front door and knocked on the door and said, are you the one that has have the talking dog for sale? He said, yeah, he's in the back. He said, could I go visit with him? He said, go right ahead. He went around the back, and there the old dog was. He said, are you the talking dog? He said, yes, sir, I am. He said, well, tell me about yourself. He said, well, years ago, I went to work for the Army doing surveillance works, and I worked for the Army for several years. And Then the FBI wanted my services, so I worked for the FBI for a while, did some undercover work. And the CIA needed me to go overseas and do some under work, uh, under cover work, and so then I decided to retire. He said, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. So he went back around and 
to see the man. He said, that's amazing. What, how much do you want for that dog? He said, $10. He said, $10? I cannot believe you're asking $10 for that dog. Why are you asking just $10? And the man said, he's a liar. He's never been outside the backyard. <laughs> he didn't realize what he had, did he? Didn't realize what he had. We are like that sometimes. Coming over here this morning, looking out over those green pastures, how blessed we are. We thank the Lord for the moisture and all the good things that we have in our circle in this part of the world. Consider this as we wrap up our message. King Ahasuerus did not deserve or have the right to have Esther as his queen. Well, why do you say that, Gary? Jewish law would not permit Jews to marry outside of their race. Jewish law would not permit Jews to marry outside of their race. Well, how did it happen? God made it happen. Do you and I deserve or have the right for eternal life and salvation? Then our righteousness is as filthy rags. So how did we get it? God made it happen, didn't he? By sending his son to die on that cross for us. Folks, a recent survey of Christian people in Christian churches were given a survey only 44% of folks in a Christian church felt like that Jesus Christ was the only way for salvation. Only 9% of young people believed that Christ was the only way for salvation. Lord, please send a revival our way. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we're so grateful. We appreciate so much the opportunity that we have to gather and worship you. Lord, give us a, a hunger to witness to others. Lord, we pray for our country. It's in a mess, and you're the only one that can fix it. Uh, Lord, give us opportunities to tell others about Jesus when we have those opportunities. Uh, please give us the... Uh, Authority, give us the, uh, the, the go forth to tell them. Give us the courage to go forth and tell them about the wonderful news of Jesus Christ. Now, Father, if there's someone here this morning that has never made a decision for you and the Holy Spirit's been working on their heart and they need to make a decision, Lord, you give them the courage to step forth this morning. This we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Y'all stand and let's sing together. <clears throat>
No. <laughs> I will be leading Wednesday night Bible study, and so I hope that you're here and we can have a good time Wednesday night. Again, I want to say thank you this morning. So let's join hands together and let's close in singing. Love somebody in the name of the Lord. Love somebody in the name of the Lord. Be a witness every day. Let the love of Christ go shining through as you travel on your way. Oh, let us be a beacon in the darkness of the world, shining with the light of Jesus' love. Set our souls afire and fill us with your power. Shower us with blessings from above.